to make sure it was right. No, it is. All right, here we go. <clears throat> and welcome back to TWIP. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Joining me on this episode of the show to discuss photography and some other cool things happening in our digital world are Mr. Sil Arena and Mr. Don Komarechka. Hey, guys, how you doing? Hey, Frederick, how are you? Hey, Don. Hey, guys. I'm I'm doing great. It's good to have both of you on the show. Uh, before we dive into it, Don Komarechka, I want to hear what you've been up to first. I know you've been running the world. Uh, this is you're enjoying your first. I think this is your first quarter as a husband, right? Yeah, you know that the, the honeymoon is over, but uh, all the the laughs and the love continue, and so I'm very happy to uh, uh, to be where I am in life. And it's it's been nonstop though. It's been so busy. Um, I just uh, actually for those of uh, of the listeners in Canada would be very interested uh, to know that. Uh, the latest episode of the CBC documentary series, The Nature of Things, will feature me front and center at the beginning and at the end of that episode. Uh, I think it's region locked for the, the people in the U.S., but there's ways around that, too. Uh, so if you're curious to see me and my obsession with snowflakes, the episode is called Chasing Snowflakes. And, uh, and so that was kind of a fun thing we did last winter and just came out a couple of days ago. Very cool. Congratulations, man. Thank awesome. you. All right, and Mr. Still Arena, what's going on in the world of, of Arena? Yeah, well, I've been uh, riding like crazy. Speedlighter's Handbook number two is uh, due out in February, and I'm scratching my head um, <laughs> because it's like it's nonstop. I'm in that manic phase. You go through months and months of like, oh, this is hard work, it's hard work, and then something magical happens, and like just the juice hits the jet engine, and you're going 1,000 miles an hour. So I spent all weekend writing a 30-page chapter on the new radio wireless speed lighting system. Uh, wow. to totally geeked out, but um, it's good stuff. It's going to be uh, it's going to be every bit as good as the first edition, and I'm amazed, honestly, at how much I've learned in five years. You know, teaching people how to do things teaches you more than you teach them most often, and so originally I thought, oh yeah, I'll just add the new radio chapter, we'll be done. Uh-uh. So I've been writing like a mad dog. Yeah. Well, you know what they say about timing. The amount of work that you need to do magically stretches to fill the time that you've allotted to do it in. <laughs> well, I apparently allotted way too much time because I still have a long way to go. But. You're like, I only had three weeks to write this, and it took exactly three weeks. That is so cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I love the sounds of deadlines as they go flying by. And you know. I know it. So. I know it. Well, cool, guys. Well, let's jump into the show. Before we do that, I want to thank our first sponsor for this episode of TWIP, and that's our good friends over at Squarespace. All right, let's jump into the show now. Story number one, guys, and I know I apologize. The last minute we did some show notes shuffling here and mixed it up. There were some other stories in here that just weren't as impactful as this DJI story. Um... And this is about, if, if folks that don't know about it, DJI is the company that makes the Phantom series of drones or unmanned aerial vehicles as, uh, or unmanned aerial systems, as DJI likes to call them. Um, but their newest one is called the Inspire One. And, you know, for me, I've been sort of holding off on this whole drone, unmanned, whatever movement because I'm like, you know what, I'm going to wait because I know they're going to come out with a cooler one, and I'm going to let all these other people run in and get the, get the first ones, and then I'm going to get the cool one, you know. So they announced it, and yes, it is crazy cool. They did this cool announcement at uh, on Treasure Island here in the Bay Area, um, which kind of sits between San Francisco and the East Bay in Oakland. Um, so they did a, a, a reveal there, and they invited a bunch of press. They invited me, but fortunately I couldn't go. I was in Santa Barbara. But it was a big to-do. They had celebrities there and all this, and they revealed this awesome new drone, which is called the Inspire One, which does a lot of cool things, some of which are it's a new, kind of a new design, first of all. Um, it has a, it can fly indoors because it has kind of a downward facing camera and sonar kind of mechanism so that it doesn't need GPS to hover and, and stay in place. It has articulating arms for the rotors so when it flies it can do kind of a transformer thing and its arms raise up so that they get out of the way of the camera. <laughs> it's just, it's like the ultimate, I mean it looks like the ultimate geek toy. So I was like, okay, 
this is it. I'm going to go buy this thing now. I waited, you know, I waited patiently to get this drone. Now I'm going in. I got to the page. I'm looking at it. I scroll down. $3,300 or $2,800, <laughs> you know, so it was, it was, I was thinking, you know, okay, it's going to be like 1200 or something like that, it's close to three grand or more properly configured, probably $3,300 to get it the way that I want to get it, so I'm like, oh, okay, well, maybe now that this one's out, I'll go get the cheaper one, <laughs> because the other ones will drop in price, so I'll go get a Phantom now, so that's, that's where my brain is now, I and mean, when these things drop down, I'll, I'll go look at these. Don Komarechka, you're, you've seen these, right? So you're you you you're the scientist here on the Twip Network. You understand how all this stuff works. When you saw this, were you interested? Did you say like, okay, I got to run out and I need this so I can get some shots of snowflakes before they get into the <laughs> the lower atmosphere? <laughs> these uh, th these and I'm going to call them tools for photographers are yeah. absolutely fantastic. They are a, a miracle of of modern technology. Even a few years ago when these, uh, well, let's call them the general term, everybody calls them drones, but um, these devices, they revolutionized the way you shot aerial video and, and got aerial stills. I've been up in helicopters and airplanes doing the traditional type of aerial photography uh, on a number of occasions, and uh, it's, it's tricky. I mean, it, there is a time and a place for that, but so often now these... Uh, these, uh, you know, the, the DJI Fa uh, Phantom, the Inspire One, and, and all of these similar devices. Of course, DJI is not the only company that makes them. Um, yeah. They're taking that entire genre by storm, uh, yeah. and they're just putting it into the hands of, uh, of of amateurs at a much much lower price than would otherwise be. I remember uh, flying around in a helicopter above downtown Toronto, uh, and the cost to rent that helicopter was $3,600 an hour. So mm -hmm. the cost to own an Inspire One in comparison is, you know, is is very very affordable. That's that's a good way to look at it. Yeah, definitely a good way to look at it. But you know, <laughs> still, it's thirty three hundred. I was talking to someone earlier today about it and and just sort of lamenting over the price. I'm like, oh, I want to get it, but. It's a little scary to be flying around in $3,300 worth of toy, you know, that high. Because if you crash, that's, uh, you know, it's not, I'm sure this thing won't be forgiving. And I don't think it has parachutes on it or anything. So, so what do you think of this? I mean, some of the specs that you might be interested in are, it's got a 12 megapixel camera on it. Right. And it shoots 4K video and can transmit it down. The DJI has this cool uh, technology that will let it beam down long distance, two beams of long distance Wi-Fi, so you can have a pilot's eye view of what's going on, so you can have one person piloting the aircraft, and then a photographer operating the camera separately, both with two different two different POVs from the ground, you know, so what do you think of that? I mean, is this the future, or are those guys that were like like Don was saying, you know, you pay thirty-three hundred dollars and go up, and we'll help you. We'll buzz the Golden Gate Bridge with you for thirty-three hundred dollars, and you get the right. shot. Well, Is let's let's, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that first. Um, yeah. The you know thirty-three hundred dollar an hour helicopter, it's going to get you places that a thirty-three hundred dollar plastic quadcopter octocopter's not going to get your camera, right? Okay. And um, it depends. Maybe. Upon it depends upon the shot. You, you know, it, I think we're going to see tons and tons of restrictions on drones coming down the tracks. And the reality is, you know, if the shot's worth going up in helicopter and shooting, because, you know, if you're in a $3,300 an hour helicopter, you're not shooting a $500 camera, right? You've got Definitely. thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in your lenses and um, your camera body. You're capturing much higher quality images. So I think it's kind of an apples and oranges comparison in that regard. Yeah, I and think you're right it, still you know, to say that there is uh, might be uh, apples and grapes because I think you know there's okay. there's there's what you said so like the the people that would still hire the helicopter and go up and get the shot and and pay those rates to get those kind of high end shots I think are, are folks with those high end budgets. But I th I think with these guys DJI and those kinds of companies are sort of democratizing aerial photography, because not everybody needs that high quality, no, and I, I've seen some of these shots from these things, and they look every bit as good as any movie I've ever seen. You know, you know so. I, don't, I don't disagree. I mean, these, the whole aerial phenomenon is following right on the coattails of GoPro, 
right? Mm -hmm. When you mm -hmm. look at all the places that non-photographers said, oh, we can put our GoPro on our surfboards, on our ski vests, on our pole doing selfies as we're going down Mount Everest or whatever it is. Yeah. And I'm not putting a GoPro on my pole, Hill. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, do it. I'll loan you my pole so you can put your GoPro on my pole. Awesome. Um, there you go. So, you know, my point is that the whole GoPro phenomenon, that billion dollar phenomenon, I think is spilling over. We just have this huge appetite, as you say, you know, to get cameras into places where the common man can do this. And I think yeah. that's the amazing thing about this technology. Although, I have to say, I'm a huge fan of the drone wipeout videos that pop up on YouTube. <laughs> you know? So you're just <laughs> drones. You're going to be that guy skeet shooting your neighbor's drone. <laughs> you know, if they'd only put hot shoes on drones, then I would be, oh, yeah, this is the quad speed light drone. It's like there you go. all over it, right? There you go. But, uh, I think, you know, they are, they are tools in the right hands and they're toys in the wrong hands or vice versa. Yeah. Um, or know, they could be, I mean, as we've talked about on previous TWIPs, they could, they're a tool and they can be used for nefarious persons by evildoers, nefarious purposes by evildoers, right. you know, so just like anything else. I mean, you use a screwdriver yeah. for bad purposes if you want to or you can right. build stuff. So, I don't know. I mean, it's interesting. You know, it's funny, I was looking at, uh, I was reading up on this and, and I was reading this comment thread, I think it was Eric Chang or somebody uh, was talking about things on Facebook, and I was just reading the comments. And I think one of the, the gist that I got was, um, I think companies like GoPro aren't necessarily, you know, working. In other words, I don't think DJI is in partnership with GoPro, <laughs> you know, because cameras like a, a device like this comes with its own awesome camera built into it, and I'm sure GoPro would like to own that space if they could, but DJI says, hey, why should we give this revenue to you? We're going to tightly integrate our camera into mm -hmm. our system and take the burden of calibration and balancing and all that stuff away from the end consumer with your device and just build it in and make a turnkey. Right. Right? Right. I mean, that's the Apple model, right? You know, yeah. Apple designs everything from the keyboard and the mouse to the screen to blah, 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 and it just works. And I yeah. think that's what these guys are doing too. Yeah. Hey, Don, so that, that technology I was talking about was, was DJI's LightBridge technology. I'm reading it. And it says the, uh, the LightBridge technology can stream 1080 video up to one mile away. But that option costs fourteen to hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah. It, well, no. It, but it's included in this uh, uh, in in this package here. It, it right. sells alone for that much. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, the, the interesting thing is. Uh, in Canada, we actually have some laws in the books now that prevent uh, people from uh, flying drones for commercial purposes without first filing a flight plan. So some of this stuff is is coming down where you know really? you have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you want to do that, oh, for commercial purposes though. For okay. commercial purposes, yeah. That makes sense. Uh, but like if you're flying, like I've got um, uh, a colleague that uh, might want to fly over a golf course, and they're yeah. being paid by the owners uh, of this golf course to do some nice aerial work there. They still need to file a flight plan. And so uh, these laws can sometimes be a little bit overbearing. They haven't really shaped them out uh, quite as well as I think they should. Um, but these are coming down because everybody can go out and buy Maybe not one at this price, but there are a lot of less expensive drones out there, yeah. uh, and fly one just about anywhere. Uh, and you know, if if it comes and crashes down, well, I mean, if if you hit somebody, you're going to hurt somebody. And so, where is your insurance? Where is all of these different little bits and pieces? So, uh, I completely understand the the risk involved in just letting anybody fly one of these without any training or license or uh, anything to, to really back up the, the safety of the people around them uh, and the safety of the airways. As they get better and better, they'll fly higher. Uh, more powerful units can go even farther away from the people operating it. And uh, and I think that this this is really interesting. Over the next couple of years, we're going to see some laws come back in and, uh, and, and maybe... Um, I don't know what the right word is, sort of cripple the usage of, of these devices. Of course. Um, yeah. But I, I still, I love what's being done with them, and I, I just, I can't wait to see what people come up with next as this technology goes forward. Uh, I'm shooting 4K fly video, fly flying these things through caves, you know, all this stuff that you could not even dream of doing before. Yeah, when you say file a flight plan, I wonder what that looks like, because me not being a pilot or a private pilot, I wonder if, if it's, 
if it's as simple as going to a website and say, hey, I'm, here's, here's a geofence around where I'm going to be flying, or I'm flying from point A, here are the coordinates to point B, and I may deviate this much, and then you submit and you go out and fly, or do you submit approval for a day, then you go out and fly, or, you know, I wonder what that looks like. Because that, if that becomes the law, that would stop me <laughs> from wanting to shoot. I mean, and like you say, it's commercial. So, yeah, if I'm doing a job and I know, like it's a wedding, and I know I'm, the wedding's on this date and it's going to be at this place on the beach and I'm going to be there, I can file it in advance and get that paperwork out of the way. But if it's something more spur of the moment, it seems like that would be, you know, a little bit of a buzzkill for being a drone pilot. But it makes sense, I mean, especially for location, because if you have to file a flight plan uh, because you want to use it commercially and you're within the vicinity of an airport, mm -hmm. then they might reject you for that. And so uh, I, 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 I can't say that I know exactly what the process is. I've never yeah. gone through it myself. I've, I'm like you, Frederick. I've yet to, to uh, dive in and, and buy one of these devices. Yeah. Um, but some of those things where I hear these laws going around, it, it kind of keeps me on the sidelines, at least right now. Yeah, Sil, you sound like you're you're the curmudgeon when it comes to drone technology. <laughs> like, I mean, I can't. For some reason, I don't see you flying around the vineyards uh, around your area, taking drone photography or introducing it into the curriculum at the school you teach at. Yeah. Why? Uh, why is that? I mean, why? Why the negativity towards drones? I, you know, I for me personally, it's like I have so many other things to do. I'm fasting with the footage, mm -hmm. um, but I'm also going to say this, and I guess it's going to sound incredibly curmudgeonly. I think our whole infatuation with aerial imagery right now is kind of like the it's like the HDR thing was eight years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it's like oh, it's a new way to process images. It's a new way to capture. It's a new way to see, and everybody's jumping on it. And as the price point comes down and down, people are going to be flying stuff and kind of stupid. I was at a soccer game, the the Cal Poly UCSB game last weekend. Um, always one of the most well-attended soccer games in the country every year, collegiate soccer. So there's 11,000 of us in the stadium and somebody's flying a drone over the stadium. Really? And I kinda, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it was part of the university because um, after a while I sort of said, I think that drone's like landing on top of the stadium and it didn't just like buzz, it was there for a while. Yeah. But my point, I kept looking up thinking, what if that thing like loses power and it's going to come down on not one person but maybe like 10 people, I don't know. Um, yeah. You know, I'll, I'll share this with you. My dad was a pilot when I was a kid. I've got hundreds of hours up in small airplanes. Oh. Um, never became a pilot myself because I just knew that like I was too creative. Oh, forgot to put the landing gear down one too many times. Mm -hmm. um, but I've got hundreds of hours, you know, up in small aircraft, so I totally get the whole infatuation with like looking down at things, right? Um, but I also realize that even you know, a small aircraft, a, a helicopter pilot. There's a park three, three, four doors down from my house. A helicopter guy could not land his helicopter there on the on the basketball court and walk home and you know have lunch and then get back in his helicopter. There's rules about where you can fly these things and I think this new technology unfortunately if I'm sound curmudgeonly it's because I'm a bit of a skeptic and my concern is that it's going to take bad things happening for rules and protocols and certification. I mean let's face it you can't go buy a set of scuba gear without being certified right you can't hardly go rent it from a legitimate shop without being like proving that you have some basic training and I think that's that. If there's any curmudgeonly, you know, ness in me, which of course there is, in this regard, it's because we don't have this protocol yet, and it's going to take some uncomfortable things happening to some people. Um, that that sounds scary, still though, because that that sounds like you're asking for government oversight, and that's what governments do, right? Generally speaking, not to make this a political show, but what happens is we have a certain body of rights and then something horrible happens and in order to protect the people some of those rights go away right, right. and they never return right? right so same with these drones you know we have a certain body of rights we can do stuff something somebody will do something stupid and someone will get hurt or something and suddenly those rights will be restricted for the rest of us kind of like right. Mr. Shoe Bomber going through the airport now we all have to take our shoes off to go through the airports right so yeah. You know, I hear you, but that scares me that, okay, we're, we're going to say, okay, hey, government, take my rights away because I'm afraid and you know better, right? I mean, I don't know. It's a double-edged well, sword. It is a double-edged sword, and it depends upon whether you're more concerned about being able to fly when you want to or whether you're concerned about having your privacy invaded. Right. You know, if I were to say to you, 
hey, you know, are you cool with the idea of my coming over to your back fence with a periscope, one of those things they use at golf tournaments, mm -hmm. and like checking you out when you're just casually residing in your backyard doing your own personal thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So there's some there's some undefined privacy issues as well. Um, and so, I mean, we're all kind of like saying, you know, we all see it in the news and on blogs and we talk about it, but um, I think it's fascinating because it's clearly not going away. People yeah. are making amazing images. I'm always stunned. I, you know, when I fly in and out of San Luis Obispo, there's some local guys who are drone pilots, and, man, they, they flew. I think they flew their drone before everybody said, oh, this isn't really cool because they have amazing footage of Hearst Castle and San Luis Obispo Mission and, you know, I'm, I'm an image maker. These are beautiful, beautiful moving images. You know, we tell our, you tell any basic photography class, oh, don't put your camera right at your eye level. Put your camera up high. Put your camera down low. Put your camera in a unique point of view. That's exactly what these machines do for us, is they put cameras instantly in unique points of view, which is why we're fascinated. So, I love I love the growth of the industry, um, you know. And I'll say this with you: my dad, all when he like stepped up and got bigger and bigger planes, Frederick, he mm -hmm. didn't own them himself. He owned them with his friends. So if you have twelve hundred bucks, I got twelve hundred bucks, which I don't. Hey. If I did. Hey, we should talk. Twelve hundred bucks. <laughs> the three of us could have a really cool. And I know you'd volunteer to keep it at your house, right? I would. I have space. I'll I'll keep it here. I'll keep it here. You know, Don, I want to have you you chime in on the privacy piece of this because it still brings up a good point. You know, somebody peeking over your fence, you know, with a drone, and they can, you know, invade your privacy, so to speak. But the the uh, argument towards that, and we did a show a while back on drones, and the argument towards that very topic was. Um, the fact that you can do that with a ladder today, and can should we outlaw ladders, right? <laughs> because they can be used to peer over fences, much like a drone could be used to peer over fences. So, Don, what, what do you think? I mean, where do you chime in on on this whole privacy piece of it? Well, I mean, you can you can break the law with so many different tools in the world. I mean, you can speed in your car. Uh, doesn't mean that they're all governed to only go the speed limit. Uh, on the road. I mean, you are allowed to break the law with these devices. That's not to say that you should. Uh, there should be a reasonable expectation of privacy that, uh, that everybody has to respect, right? And so when you're flying these devices, if somebody's in their backyard, that, that's, that's a private place. If somebody's on a public beach, however, um, that's not a uh, a private space. You, you are in public. If you're on a street in New York, you're in public. And so there is no expectation of privacy in a lot of these places. And the line where these two meet is not a solid black and white cutoff. It is a gray area. And so that becomes a bit sticky when we try and figure out where that happens to be. And I want to say to, uh, to Sil's point as well, he's, he talked about scuba diving. I mean, everybody can go out and get a uh, you know get certified as long as they, they pass to go scuba diving. You have to pass a test to, to drive a car. Um, you have to I, I think that it's not overreaching to say that you have to have a license to know safety and to maybe have a certain level of insurance to fly one of these things like you would uh, like any kind of aircraft of any kind. Yeah. I, I, I don't think that that's infringing rights. I think that that's just keeping everybody safe from from mistakes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, this this Inspire 1, I think it's, you know, it's the same technology as the ones before, arguably refined and made much much cooler, but the same arguments arise, right? It's the same the same discussions, and now it seems much more easy, right? So before the some of the some of the drones or air, un, unmanned aerial vehicles they required a bit of setup to get things going. This one, I think, part of its claim to fame is that it's an out of the box experience. So you turn it on, take it out of the box. I would assume charge it up a little bit, and you're flying immediately. So, so I think you might be seeing a couple of more drones in the Paso area coming up pretty soon. So keep your eye out. Silarina, are you still there? Uh-oh. I think Sil, oh. Sil froze in a position looking directly at the camera. I thought he was just bored. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll, wait, we'll wait for Sil to return. But well, I want to add one more comment, if I can, yeah, for uh, uh, Frederick. It, it, you say that it's an, an out-of-the-box experience, right? Yeah. You can just take it out of the box and fly it. Well, yeah. 
that was kind of the same idea with HDR, you know, like Sol had mentioned eight years ago or, or whenever, when a lot of the software just presented people with no experience a bunch of sliders that they could adjust willy-nilly in any position that they wanted until they got something that, to their eyes, looked, air quotes, good. Um, yeah. Now, to the rest of the world, it might have looked like clown puke, but uh, the, the end result was that anybody could try this, and that doesn't mean that you got an instant amount of great results from it. You had a lot of, uh, you know, l let's say photo editing mistakes sure. uh, along the way, and while that's a, a, a mistake in editing, because it's an outside, you know, just take it out of the box and use it. You don't need any training. You can just move this stuff around. If you apply that exact same idea to something like a drone, I think we're all in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, you know, my, my uncle told me once, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. No, that was <laughs> that was Uncle Ben and Peter Parker. That wasn't my uncle. <laughs> but with great power, with you know, with these drones, um, comes great responsibility. So you're you're right. It's a it's a tool that can be used for ill or for good. So I don't know. It's crazy. This is this is a good time. So um while we're waiting on Syl to return, I'm gonna jump into story number two. And this is pretty interesting, and we believe that this is a site that has come from the DJI folks, we think, um, and it's called Skypixel. So it's a new site for aerial photographers and videographers, and here's the blurb. It says, Skypixel will become the world's gathering place for high-quality photography and videography. It will be a place for professional and social collaboration. One-on-one -on -one connections and discussion group interaction will drive everyone to become more skillful and successful while doing what we all love to do. Sounds interesting. So uh, when I boil that down, it looks like it's a social network for aerial photography. Is that is that what we're looking at? I, I think, think that's the description that they've given, uh, in mm -hmm. essence. And that that's kind of puzzling, you know, because that, that's a fairly, you know, in the grand scheme of the world population, you know, you see all the social uh, networks that are so successful because they're very inclusive. And this one mm -hmm. is very exclusive to simply aerial photographers. Right. Um, and uh, to, to your point that we think that it, it is uh, owned by uh, uh, DJI, I, I looked up their domain name and it's registered and owned by DJI. So that might point uh, specifically in that direction, yeah. which is interesting. Uh, and, and it's funny that this is sort of launched right alongside of their uh, inspiration. Fire one. Uh, have you taken a look through their website, Frederick? Have you seen? I did. Uh, I looked around operates? a little bit. I set up an account, you know, because I wanted to grab my name and all that. But I haven't. Uh, I don't have any aerial imagery to put in there, so <laughs> I felt left out. So but the the interesting thing too is uh, I'm I'm a, an avid user of 500px, uh, another uh -huh. sort of social, uh, you know, photo sharing website. And uh, oddly enough, they don't have a category for aerial uh, images in there. So maybe this is filling a niche that needs to be filled. Mm. Um, but I'm looking at the two side by side, and to me, these are just too similar. Uh, like there's this uh, rating that looks almost like almost exactly like 500px's pulse with views, likes, and faves. 500px has the exact views, likes, and faves, followed mm -hmm. by social links right below it. Who liked this photo and who favorited this photo in separate uh, breakout boxes on the lower right-hand side, which is exactly what 500px does too. It mm -hmm. seems really odd that it's so similar uh, in its design to, to another website uh, to the point where uh, it's, it's making me curious about uh, any user interface, uh, you know, patents or stuff that might be behind the scenes uh, from one or, or another company. Um, that being said, when you go to this website, it gives you like this big splash screen which has some video rotating in it. And it's the first time I think I've seen a splash screen in about eight or nine years. You know, it, it, it's, it kind of comes up a little bit odd, like it doesn't bring you right into the experience. It's, it's trying to uh, do a, a hard sell on, on why you want it without actually showing it to you. So I have a few reservations. Uh, that's not to say that the idea of having uh, a platform specifically for the aerial photographer uh, or videographer is a bad idea because, you know, a lot of these people are so passionate about what they do. They eat, sleep, and breathe it. Uh, and to have a place for them all to congregate, I think it's fantastic. Um, the the tie-in too with DJI is, is is a bit odd. Now you know me, Frederick. I like to dig into the the terms and conditions and to figure out yeah, all yeah. Of this stuff. That's right? why we love you on Twip, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and, and so it's interesting because uh, I I make I made a specific note that uh, in their uh, you know uh, terms of use they request uh, you know royalty free, sublicensable, perpetual, transferable, and irrevocable, uh, a, as well as a bunch of other stuff uh, licenses to your images, and uh, that means that even if you pull your content off. 
they still own the rights to use it. So if it's ever up there for any reason, then uh, then they, they've got it for whatever purposes they want um, for use with them or any of their affiliates. And DJI is clearly at least an affiliate within that. And so DJI, I guess, would have the rights to use anything for any purpose uh, uploaded to the website by the way their terms of use is currently structured. Mm. That, that kind of makes me raise an eyebrow. Uh, I'm not, to, not to say that they're going to do anything nefarious because you know, whether or not they'll lose in the court of law, uh, they will probably lose in the court of public opinion and, uh, and, and they don't want to do that. And I don't expect companies that have these rules would go out and use them in really sinister ways, but the legal language would allow them to do that. And so uh, I, I look at that kind of stuff and kind of I, I kind of shake my head a little bit. Like they should have somebody go through that and make it a bit fair for both sides. Um, but uh, you've like th these discussions have come up with a lot of different uh, you know, social networking websites that always overreach and have somewhat draconian laws. Oh, I know Facebook is yeah. famous for this as well. Yeah, yeah. Facebook and Instagram were you know they came kept coming under fire earlier this year and last year about their far-reaching terms of services and in one case they backpedaled a little bit and, and issued statements and all that. So yeah, that's interesting that you, you dug in and found that. So welcome back. We were we moved on to talk about... Yep. Sil, are you still there? You're I'm there. here. He is there. Uh, okay. We moved on to talk about Skypixel and the site and Don was talking about their terms of service and all that and before he was talking about the similarities of the UI design to um, 500px. So I want to get your thoughts on that, looking at it. And then specifically from the standpoint, so I agree there's, there's similarity. And I look at it from the standpoint of if I was a 500px, I would say, oh, that's interesting. I'm going to add an aerial category now, <laughs> you know, just like that. I'm going to write, a, you know, punch a couple buttons, check a, you know, check a couple of check boxes, and now we have an aerial area and let's blast it out to our users and say welcome all you aerial photographers we have a brand new area for you why wouldn't they just do that and kind of like squash this before it gets started it's a great question it's a great question um you know i don't know i mean i i've got a 500 px account um don't mm -hmm. do much with it uh i'm looking at sky pixel and you know, there's beautiful footage, um, and I'll say this: kudos to Don for digging into the terms of service and, like, you know, it, it's, it's like, okay, I'm going to send you some paperwork from now on. I just <laughs> click the box, whatever you say goes. I'll click the box, yeah. um, and I think you know that's a fault of mine. And I props to you, Don, for reading all of that and thinking about it. This is a rights grab. Then hopefully they'll get sniffed out for it. I don't know that it is. Um, I will say this though, categorically, in, in taking the curmudgeons approach, if SkyPixel exists to do a couple of things, one to be a showcase for really great aerial work, whether it's still or motion work, and if through that they build a community where enthusiasts can come and, you know, learn the lay of the land, I mean, learn like what, if there is an industry protocol, um, I think that you know Skypixel would have that potential, perhaps, to really shape the future of how the public opinion of you know drone usage and maybe maybe it's too late to to have any momentous effect like that. But I look at this site and say it's beautiful photos, and if anything, I hope that they or somebody will truly become ground zero for dialogues between experienced pilot and novice pilots and. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe form some consensus among pilots as to what their responsibilities are, whether they're legislated or not. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know. Yeah, this is like a brand new category, I think. I mean, and, you know, mm -hmm. to your point, Sil, about this might be faddish, like the HDR trend of several years ago, um, but maybe not, you know. It could, it, this, is a, this is a new genre of hardware, not just a software technique, so... You know, it could it could have lasting staying power. But then when I look at it, I think, uh, you know, is is if this is a a, a kind of permanent solution that we're gonna or a permanent technique or genre of photography that's gonna have long lasting staying power, that means the Lynda.coms, the Kelby trainings, the creative lives out there, all those guys need to be tooling up train photographers mm -hmm. on this, you know, new different cool techniques that right. relate to aerial photography, right? Well, and well, you too, Sil, right? You, you, you like you said, out. strap some strobes on this thing. <laughs> um, what makes you think I haven't? Um, <laughs> chapter 38, speed light. Yeah, there you go. Um, 
That's why it'll never be finished, that damn book. Uh, yeah. No, seriously, though, I, I will say this. This is a category that is going to be around forever because um, mankind is, I mean, we're fascinated with flight, at least those of us who aren't afraid of heights, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting here just letting the sky pixel feed loop, and I'm just, you know, I, if I drift off just looking at that, and like I said, I've been flying with my dad ever since I was a little kid, so that's <laughs> a bunch of decades. Um, <laughs> And I, I, I'm always, you know, big airliners, little airplanes, whatever. I'm always the window seat guy. I want to, yeah. you know, day or night, wherever I'm going, I want to look down and see. Um, so whether I ever become an aerial pilot or not doesn't matter. I'll, I'll suck up this kind of imagery for years. But let me suggest this to you as well. Um, there's really two sides to this. One is being the pilot and mm -hmm. one is being the photographer. And I think they're two different skill sets. Um, you know, there are guys who've been flying remote control helicopters for years who are great pilots. Doesn't mean that they necessarily know how to operate the camera on these things in terms of how quickly you're going to pan, how quickly you're going to do everything else. And uh, as <laughs> as you've seen on YouTube, as I've seen on YouTube, those guys who try to fly one of these things, uh, you know, it's like you can fly the helicopter or you can look at what it's shooting, but it's really hard to do both very well at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think for me, the more I think about this, because I think eventually I will dive in mm -hmm. and get one. Um, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but eventually I will get one. But I think it makes sense to go cheap, right? Go get a cheap entry level one that still has capabilities. Don't get one of the little plastic five dollar ones, but get a really a good one that that has kind of good GPS and aerial characteristics and learn and hit the wall with that. Kind of like with photography, right? You don't yeah. go out and buy a D3S or a GH4 or whatever out of the gate. If you're just starting, you could start with something pedestrian, get used to it, hit the wall in terms of, wow, I wish I had more low light. And with this thing, man, I wish it had better GPS stabilizing capabilities you know, or a better gimbal on it. And right. then you go and think about the Inspire and start dropping hints to your spouse about the Inspire. Right, right, right. right, so, right. That would probably be the way that I would go. I'd probably go look on eBay or even buy new, a new older drone, you know, and play around with that, beat it up, and then go <laughs> go get a good one. You know? I don't know. Don, yeah. you, you, you agree with that? Yeah, I, I would totally beat the snot out of one of those things, just practicing and learning how it handles and, and how to land it properly, and I'd crash it. I know yeah. I would. Uh, yeah. And so why would I want to crash a Ferrari when I can, you know, crash a Pinto? Yeah. Hey, man, what's wrong with Pintos? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll have you know my Pinto. No, I'm kidding. I don't have a Pinto. Uh, but my best friend had a Pinto in high school. We called it the bomb because you remember the... Uh, you know, the, the defect they had, if you got yeah. rear-ended, it would explode. So we called it the yeah. grenade, I think it was. Yeah, that was a feature. <laughs> yeah, that was not good. All right, guys. Still, do you have anything to add before we jump on this topic? I was just curious. I just pulled up borrow lenses to see if they're renting these things yet, and um, I don't see it up there, which is kind of telltale that, you know, there's a lot of risk with these devices because I was thinking, well, just go rent it and get the insurance policy and crash it and say, oh, yeah, here's a box with 300 parts. There's your, there's your drone back. <laughs> he sent a box back, and you're like, Wait, what's in this? Right. Know, a bunch of rocks. Yeah, that would be scary. All right, guys, before we jump into the rest of this, uh, story number three is going to be a quick one. So let me, let me read this. So you guys are familiar with the actress Kiera Knightley, um, very talented, beautiful actress. She says this. Um, and this was in reference to a, a photo shoot where she appeared topless under the condition that her images wouldn't be photoshopped. She was interviewed and she said, I've noticed that people who started on film have the ability to see the person in front of them, whereas a lot of photographers who have only worked with digital or in digital, the relationship between the photographer and the person who they're taking a picture of sort of doesn't exist anymore. They're looking at a computer screen as opposed to the person. So, uh, first of all, my, my response is like, who are you? <laughs> you know, you're making this kind of comment, this blanket comment about all photographers, but that's just me. Don, what, did you, what do you think? Do we care what Kira Knightley says about photographers? Well, I mean, for people just like her, Leica came out with a, a, one of their digital cameras without a screen on the back of it recently. So there, there is a product specifically for, for that idea. But 
in a, in a more general sense, though, I think that if you take a picture and you look at the screen to make sure that it's perfect, rather than uh, having some innate sense of, of understanding your art perfectly and just taking that perfect picture and not taking your eyes away from that interaction with the person that you're photographing, I think that there's something to be said for that. Mm -hmm. I think, though, that even if you do understand your artwork, uh, you know, like the back of your hand, you don't need to double check. It's there, and everybody is compelled to do that. And maybe that breaks the experience. Maybe that takes that interaction and separates it a little bit by putting technology in the mix, and it's no longer just a person-to-person -person kind of interaction. Yeah. I don't photograph a lot of people, uh, so I don't think that I've ever really been in this situation. Uh, but that's just sort of my take on it. And I, I think she does have a valid point to some degree. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I have to disagree with that. I hope the, the TWIP army will comment on this post and tell us what they think. So, Who's we, to imagine we, now? I, 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 you imagine know, now? I mean, I just don't... Maybe... I mean, I've shot both, right? So I don't see the disconnect because I can see my image on an LCD. Does that mean that I'm stuck uh, behind the LCD and I can't do this? I okay, think... Yeah, turn the, <laughs> you know, I can't <laughs> go over the camera to make eye contact with my subject. I am looking at that LCD, and that's all I can do. It's it's yeah. kind of... I don't know. What would you tell your students? Um, well, let me answer a different question. <laughs> um, so, because I've seen the photos, and... Uh -huh. um, they're beautiful. Um, they're tasteful. They're done. In, you know, they're very French, and so uh, you know, French viewers going to look at these images completely different than American viewers will. Mm -hmm. But I think this is a golden point. I shot film for decades, literally thirty years plus, because I started when I was a wee lad, um, before I got my first digital camera. And I think she actually, and I would respect her opinion because she spent hundreds of hours of her professional life in front of cameras, not necessarily still cameras, but I when, I, when I, I mean, read this... Not, no I disrespect this, to models, though, Syl. That's kind of saying, like, hey, I've got five million frequent flyer miles, so I'm qualified to tell the pilot how to land this thing. You know, it's, uh, I don't know. Completely different. I, you know, f who better than a professional model, and she's an actress, not a model, who right. better than a professional model to know what it's like to have rapport or not have rapport with a photographer? That's true. And I that's, what she's, that's what she's really saying. Back in the days when we shot film, we set our exposure settings based upon the best guesses of Polaroids, light meters, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. but it got ultimately down to the relationship between the photographer and the person the photographer is photographing. Mm -hmm. And I get what she says. That's lacking today? Absolutely. Absolutely. But how is that lacking, though, Sil? How, how is it lacking because that people you through... You know, I can still see you. Because well, every, every, you time, an optical connection? every time you stop to check the LCD of your camera, you're breaking that rapport with your subject, whether you think uh, okay. or not. That, That's that what too. she's saying. That's mm -hmm. all she's saying. That's all this is about, um, you know, plus the topless photograph, you know, in Interview Magazine. But, mm -hmm. um, and... So that's what she's saying, though. It's about, and that's why a model would even know better than an actress, but an actress is certainly going to know about the rapport of the lens with her and the person behind the camera. So yeah. I totally get, because when I shot film forever, that's all we had. It's like you had a best guess. You, if you were shooting medium format, large format, you pulled your Polaroids, you took your light meter readings, and then you know ultimately it got down to in the lab, you do little snip tests and try to make better educated guesses, you know all that, as to how to process your film, and now we get caught up in the, in the, in the spur of the moment technology, and every time we look at the back of our camera, we're taking our attention off of the person in front of the lens. Yeah. So I think, it's, I think it's a golden point. It truly resonated with me. It's like, she's absolutely right, and how wise of her to recognize that. Um, so I don't know. You know, there's not a whole lot of a story here, but I think yeah. it's a fascinating concept, and what it reminds me is, yeah, I need to tell my kiddos, hey, you know, let's put some back here where you can see what it's like to shoot without looking at an image. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's an easy way around that too. I mean, if 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 in fact this is valid, and I'll get, I'll I'll concede that I understand, you know, looking breaking eye contact with the subject and looking at the back of the camera, yeah, that's gonna, of course, you're gonna break that eye contact and mm -hmm. and. Uh, 
you know, and it won't be as intuitive as it would have been had you mm-hmm. been in the moment the entire time. But with you know the, today's digital cameras, you can turn them back off, right? So you could turn the back off of the camera, and it essentially becomes like an old school camera that didn't have the uh, the LCD on the back. So you can continue taking pictures, and you don't have that visual feedback if you want to if you want to maintain that right. level of interaction with your subject. And, and Kira's point is this: that people who've only grown up with digital cameras don't know what it's like to not be able to look at your images after every push of the shutter button. Yeah. So those of us who shot film, who had no choice, like, oh, have I have I shot that way, you know, in years? No. Mm-hmm. Um, but I get that. It's like, okay, so let's not look at the back of our cameras. And let me just go out to the audience who's listening. If you've never, like, shot 100 frames without looking at your camera and you shoot people, especially people, um, in an up-close and personal situation, take off, tape off the back of your camera, whatever it does... You know, just so you don't pixel peep, and see what it's like to have that rapport with the person or the people you're photographing. You know, it's just you and them, and the camera becomes this transparent device that doesn't distract you like a digital camera does. Yeah, and Don, Don I want to have you chime in on this. I wonder what the trade-off is with that, um, because yeah, like still saying, you 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 break that rapport when you're looking at the back of the camera. But then the information that you get from the back of the camera could lead to a better photograph, right? So by not looking at the LCD, oh, man, I wish I had looked because now everything's overexposed or whatever. But I have rapport with my subject the entire time. Is are you trying to capture exposure or are you trying to capture personality? And I think that, uh, you know... Yes, if, the answer is yes, both. <laughs> well, but the, the exposure should not be something that you're checking on the fly while you've already established a rapport with the person. That should be just something that you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, that should be something that's already been established. And now you don't need to check and reconfirm that with every single shot. Uh, you need to keep that rapport building. You need to capture the personality and the character of the person on the other end of the lens. And and uh, that the camera can be a tool to separate those two, and that's not a good thing. Um, I, I, I want to say that the, the whole interview was a great read, too. I mean, we took one small excerpt mm-hmm. out of it, uh, but I'd encourage the, uh, the, the listeners to go and check that out. There is some uh, NSFW uh, uh, images. Yes. Uh, yeah, they're, yeah. they're tastefully done, but just keep that in mind. Yes, uh, not, and not for kids. Yeah. No, it, it, but the, the, the idea, you know, this was one statement in here, but the photographer uh, said that, you know, he, he grew up with film. This is the way that he does it, and he works extremely quickly, too. And mm-hmm. so he gets the images so quickly before the, the model has time to really get tired. Uh, and so if you're constantly checking on the back of the screen and you're taking more time because of that, then you may have missed the moment anyhow. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Again, Twip Army, chime in on this. I want to hear what you guys have to say. This is, uh, you know, this is a this is a topic that we haven't tackled on this week in photo before. So this is a very very interesting. All right, guys. Before we jump into the picks of the week, I want to thank another one of our sponsors for this episode of Twip, and that's our friends at FreshBooks.com. All right, guys. Let's jump into the listener Q and A. Thomas Johnson, which ironically is my dad's name, so I wonder if this is my dad asking this question. He says he has a Youngyo YN563 flash, and he wants to get a set of their remote triggers, but he doesn't know which trigger will work best best with his Olympus EPL5. Problem is, when he researches, he can't find anything about them with Micro Four Thirds cameras. Does anybody have any knowledge or advice on the subject? Silarina, mm-hmm. you are writing a book on strobe photography. Yeah. You should know a little bit about this, I think. What do you think? I, I hate to admit, I actually have um, this light and what I'm about to recommend on the night table next to my bed right now. That's how close I am to this. It's like the <laughs> first qu- listener q and in 100 years that I've actually known the answer to. Um, <laughs> you know all of them, whatever. So uh, here's the thing. The Yongno uh, YN563 flash is a manual-only flash that has a built-in radio receiver. So the answer is really simple. You've got to get the matching transmitter, which is the YN560-TX. And I looked it up online um, on the Micro Four Thirds forum that I didn't even know existed, but there's a forum for everything, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and people say that it works just beautifully. Um, the cool thing about this controller device which sits in the camera's hot shoe, you can control, it's got a vertical LCD, so you can say, oh, this little speed light is a group A speed light, this one's a group B, that's a group C, and you can control in manual only, no ETTL stuff, um, but that's fine for most people. You can adjust the power from the top of your camera. I think the only thing that the transmitter needs is literally that fire now hot shoe contact that it's going to get just by being connected. Um, and I'll tell you this uh, on a completely unsolicited basis because I these guys brought out a clone to Canon's radio speed lighting gear and mm -hmm. I just tested it this weekend for the book. Um, it's not my pick of the week but I'm stunned um, because not only is it fully compatible with Canon's gear, it does some sync things that Canon's gear doesn't do, mm -hmm. um, like second curtain sync in wireless, which Canon shooters have never had. Mm -hmm. So a lot of respect um, for these this company. You know, it's a third-party clone, knockoff kind of company, but in the case of this transmitter, the YN560-TX, they designed it from the ground up, and it works beautifully with the flash that this guy's already got. So, how does how does the clone compare to the Canon OEM stuff in terms of price? Oh, you know, it's it's about half, third yeah. to half the price. Um, and I haven't had it long enough. I have not shot it out in the field. Um, you know, the build quality is not a hundred percent what it is in Canons. Um, mm -hmm. But what I'm more interested in is how does it interface with the system and does it have the ability to talk to the menus that are built into Canon's, um, the speed lighting menus that we can pull up on the back of the camera because so many third-party devices um, don't have access or don't aren't coded to access those on-camera menus. Right. So right. in the case of Yong No, this is a manual-only um, solution, but you know it's a pretty affordable. I'm looking on Amazon right now. You get the transmitter and two of the flashes for a couple hundred bucks, and there really is no more affordable way to get started with off-camera light, as long as you're willing to dial the power up or down on your own completely. Yeah, awesome. Perfect answer. Thank you for that. Mr. Komarechka, you have anything to add to that? Nope. <laughs> He's like, nope. <laughs> what this guy said in the box next yeah, to me. <laughs> what he said, yeah, I, he summed it up better than I could. I did a bit of research uh, to say that, yes, it would work, but beyond that, I was uh, I was hoping Sil would fill in all the gaps. Uh, he answered but, it. I, Thanks. I got lucky on that one. No, no, you didn't. You know your stuff, man. <laughs> like how to photograph an owl from a hundred, you know, miles away. I'm not very good on that kind of stuff. Yeah, me yeah, either. You know, haven't haven't found myself in that situation yet. So, all right, guys. Well, listeners, if you have a question that you want us to answer on the show, be sure to visit our website at thisweekinphoto.com and click on that submit a question link, and you can send us a question, or you can even leave us a voice message, which we may or may not play live on the show. Just saying. You know what? I need to close this interview magazine window because it is distracting me. <laughs> so, See? Yeah, it's yeah. like the back Thank of your you camera. Here, Knightley, you are now off my computer. <laughs> it's just like the back of your camera. See? <laughs> yeah. Distracted. I'm breaking contact with my, my co-host. I noticed you glanced away. I was looking over there. It was in the corner of my eye looking at me. I had to get rid of it. All right, guys. Let's jump into the picks of the week. Uh, Don Komarechka, I'm going to let you go first. What's your pick of the week? Well, this one might also be in uh, in Sill's wheelhouse. Uh, as a lot of people know, I do a lot of macro photography, and so I just picked up Canon's new ring flash. Uh, they have the the MR fourteen EX Model Two, and uh, faster uh, flash recycling times, which is great. But the the big seller on this one for me, the reason why I bought this was it's kind of a silly thing, but it was missing from the first version of this flash. If if you turn on a special custom function on the flash, when it's on, if you double tap your shutter button it will automatically turn on the focusing lamps. So I don't have to take my eye away from the viewfinder and uh, double tap again and they go away. I don't have to take my eye away from the viewfinder and hit a button on the back of the flash and then completely ruin my composition, especially when I'm doing handheld work. So um, this will be a big game changer for me for that one simple little reason. Uh, I've used it in the field. It runs so fast. Uh, I connect an external battery uh, pack to this thing, and uh, and I'm all set. It it doesn't lose power at all. So uh, I you know if you're uh, if you're a flash nut like Sill, I mean this is something that uh, that would be uh, you know a, a fun thing to to have and to play with. But if you're into macro photography at all, I always recommend using a flash. And I haven't used a better ring flash uh, than this one. Mm. 
I was going to ask you, so first two questions, what, what does that thing cost? And for our uninitiated listeners that are wondering, why would I ever need a ring flash, uh, answer those two questions. Uh, it costs 500 bucks, so okay. it's, it's not that cheap. Um, now you can get ring flashes out there for like 30 bucks, but you don't want them because they use LEDs instead of the uh, the, the xenon flash tubes that this guy has, as well as uh, you know I think the Sigma one has that as well. But uh, they've got the same flash technology that a standard speed light would have, uh, as yeah. far as the instantaneousness of the light, and that's what you want to really prevent motion blur in your photographs. But when I'm photographing a uh, you know just anything super small, uh, the light kind of needs to be around the subject uh, very close to it and so this gives me a very convenient way to get the light right around the lens itself where uh, where it's needed. Now, I don't use it for everything though. Um, if I'm photographing water droplets or anything that has a spherical surface to it, the mm -hmm. ring flash will leave a ring flash reflection on the surface of that and it kind of ruins the look. So it's not the be all end all magic bullet but I use it for snowflakes, for insects, for flowers, for lots of stuff. And yeah. uh, it, uh, it it makes it very easy to get good light. And you can, on these models, you can make one bank uh, brighter than the other. You can turn one half of it off entirely, and you can make the light come from the top, bottom, left, right, in any which way that cool. you want. Uh, yeah. So it's it, it's a great way to, to get into this kind of flash without getting overwhelmed by the technical logistics of it all. Yeah. All right. Cool. I like it. So, we'll link to so, that. Let me jump yeah. in. Um, Don, I didn't know about the double tap. I just wrote that down. That's going to be in the book, so maybe I owe you a copy. Oh, um, <laughs> modeling lights on, that's a cool tip. I didn't know that. The other thing that's cool about the MR14 EX2, and this I did know, but um, is that it's, it is one of the speed lights that can access the camera's menu system. So you don't have to make the buttons and dials changes on the back of the speed light. You just find the external speed light control menu on your camera's LCD. As long as you're not, not going to with, you might as well be futzing with the flash menu on the back of your camera. But for a guy like me who has to wear reading glasses all the time, being able to pull that menu up on the back of the camera is so much easier than trying to see those little icons on the LCD. Love it. So, so, so when, before we leave that topic, yeah. um, Don does a lot of, obviously, close-up and macro-type work. What other... What other uses for macro or for ring lights do you know of? So ring light, you know, it's it's kind of a, a one-trick pony when it comes to um, portraits. It's what's used when you see a, a photograph of somebody like up against a wall and they've got that cool kind of halo shadow that's running around them. That's a ring light. Um, they're used a lot in high-end fashion. Um, and some people like to use them off camera, off axis from the lens because they think that the bigger surface of the flash, but honestly what you're giving up in the case of this particular unit is a whole lot of flash power. If you want that off camera ring light thing, you're better to get um, one of the ring light adapters and put it onto a full power speed light. Yeah, so. um, right. But it's, it's, a, it's a great you know, tool. And the other thing I'll say is uh, I know for a fact that you can use this as a wireless master. So if you want to take one of your speed lights and put it on the rock behind the beautiful flower so that it doesn't fall off to complete blackness, you can do that as well. Very cool. So. All right, so in solidarity of yeah. you and your reading glasses, I've donned my reading glasses. There we go. And I can actually see the hangout now. This is yeah. so weird. <laughs> there are people in here with me. I didn't even know it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, what's your while you're on a roll here? What's your pick yeah, of the week? Yeah. So, I'm gonna. I gotta. I gotta say, I'm gonna just share the canon love and keep the train rolling. Um, I got on the day of release the new Canon 7D Mark II, and I've been a full frame shooter for years, but I had to get um, the 7D Mark II. So I've had it what two weeks now. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's an incredible little camera. Uh, I love the 10 frames per second. The first thing I did when I went to the Cal Poly game is, you know, they got the countdown clock, and I was like, oh, I'm just going to photograph the clock on the scoreboard, and sure enough, shooting 10 frames per second. The thing that I'm most excited about is that um, Canon has put the metering system from the 1DX into this little sub-$18 camera body, and what that gives us for the first time in flash history anyway um, is RGB metering. Most often when we do like ETTL metering, they're just looking at how much light's coming back. They're not, the, the camera's not saying, oh, those particular pixels are the colors of skin tone, therefore I'm going to pay more attention. Now 
this camera has that ability and I got it expressly uh, one so I could say that I could shoot 10 frames per second <laughs> um, like uh, you know like a sports shooter but more importantly I, I think this RGB flash metering technology might have some huge ups that comes to ETTL flash metering which is uh, you know it's an, a nightmare for a lot of people but it's a really important part of speed lighting for a lot of uh, event and wedding photographers so 70 Canon 70 Mark II sweet little camera and what was a uh, how much did that thing run you like 1800 bucks not bad you know bad. it's you look half, at all the technology half of a half of a drone you could uh... <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't let you fly my 7D Mark II <laughs> drone <laughs> Awesome. Cool, guys. All right. Uh, well, hey, it looks like we're at the end of another episode of This Week in Photo. I want to thank our sponsors for their support. Silarina, while you're on roll here, what is a good location where people can come follow you and right. harass you about hating drones and all that? But love and cure nightly. Um, <laughs> pixelated, <laughs> my blog. Uh, it's P is in Paul, I X S Y L A T E D, pixelated.com. Awesome. Pixelated.com. Thanks for coming on. So always always, always a fun. pleasure having you. Thank you. All right. Mr. Don Komarecha. Don Komarechka. I want to call you Dom. The Dom. The Don Komarechka. I've been called people... worse. Go for it. Uh... <laughs> oh, there you go. We'll just call you the Dom from now on. The Don. What uh where's it, where would you like people to go to keep up with you? Uh, well, you can check out my website at doncom.ca, and everything's linked to there. I'm most active on Google+, Plus, though, so uh, feel free to uh, to hit me up on there and see what my latest happenings are. And uh, it's going into uh, to winter and snowflake season once again, so if you're curious to get out there and uh, and maybe photograph some of your own, I've got a book on that topic as well. It's all linked to the website, so check that out. Awesome. I mean, one other thing before I let you get off the hook here, Don, you, we are working on a show together, um, so just remind the listeners of what's going on. I don't even think we've named the show yet, but we kind of know what it's going to be. Give us a, a sneak peek into what you're going to be doing on the work. Well, it, it, it's wonderfully in the works right now. Uh, again, the, the, the name is the hardest part for something like this, that it's something eclectic in the world of photography. You can't really pin it down. We're going to hit a lot of topics that aren't normally covered, things that are fascinating behind the scenes, whether it's the difference between how you see and how a camera sees, the underlying technology and why we should care about it, um, all sorts of little quirky things in photography that everybody will find either entertaining or educational to some degree. Yep. And uh, I think it's going to be so much fun. Yeah, I, I like to call you our Neil deGrasse Tyson of photography. <laughs> <laughs> With a couple of key differences, but you are Neil deGrasse Tyson of photography. So thank oh, geez, I, I thank you so much for giving me such an accolade. I don't feel like I deserve it, at least not yet. Yeah, not yet. Well, we'll see. All right, uh, and listeners, be sure to visit the website. Photo.com. If you want to check out all of our shows, you can head over to thisweekinphoto.com slash subscribe and check out all the shows on the TWIP network. And with that, it is time to take that lens cap off. <laughs>